So this is part two of Hands-On Big Data and I am Ryan Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University. And so in this section we are going to talk about Hadoop and MapReduce and we're still in the slides phase. We are going to uh, discuss these concepts in the abstract uh, to some degree before in the future sections jumping into the hands-on. So let's talk about Hadoop. Um, so I think this quote or description of the history of Hadoop from the Cloud Era website is worth reproducing in full. Uh, Hadoop was developed originally by Doug Cutting uh, in about 2005 and Google also had developed its own approach to handling the huge amount of data that it was collecting. Google tends to have somewhat proprietary uh, technologies, so things that they're developing in-house for their own use are not completely available. They tend to influence other products. So in this case, uh, Google wrote some papers about how they were handling this, but the open source version that developed to deal with the same problem uh, was handled by the Apache Foundation, Apache which produces uh, the Apache web server originally and many other uh, open source projects. Uh, Apache is the home for the Hadoop project. So the Hadoop project is essentially a way to store and process data across a large cluster of standardized cheap servers. And as it explains here, instead of something expensive and proprietary, you can use this cheap system or build your own system. And with Hadoop, no data is too big. Okay, so the cluster of computers in a Hadoop cluster functions as a single large-scale storage unit. And the Hadoop software is handling all this management of how we um, put the files on all the many different machines in the cluster and bring them back. Uh, you should also know that Hadoop is originally named for Doug Cutting's child's toy, uh, Hadoop the Elephant, just a name that his ch child had uh, given this, this toy, invented, and so it doesn't, it's not an acronym for something else, it doesn't have a technological meaning, but it is represented by a yellow elephant uh, because Hadoop, the original Hadoop, was a yellow elephant. And you can read more about that on this uh, site that's linked. Um, the complete documentation for m many of the things I'm going to talk about are Apache projects. And if you go to the Apache.org Foundation site, um, you will get what's really the best source of documentation. It's good to get an introduction to, you know, what is this all about? somewhere else. You may find some introductory guides that will walk you through. But again, these are rapidly changing technologies. You might have new versions coming out that make significant changes uh, as they, they come out. The original websites are always going to be the most complete source of documentation. So once you get somewhat familiar with a particular piece of software, I'd recommend you know keeping in touch with that original source site. So Hadoop manages the Hadoop distributed file system. Um, again, the links in the presentation will take you into the real details. We're not going to go into that here. Uh, but the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS, allows you to treat a cluster as one big hard drive. And we're going to just look real quick at the Hadoop architecture. Um, give a feel for how this works. So in Hadoop there is a name node which is kind of the controller or the master of the system and there are slave nodes. So these are lots of different locations out in the computer cluster. You can think of each one of these five boxes in this image as a computer and when I say save this big blob of data on a Hadoop cluster the request goes to the name node. The name node chunks that blob into discrete parts, 
and it can put one part on each of the clusters in the node and it also has a job tracker system. It needs to confirm that yes it successfully wrote the data to the node um, and it's done. If it encounters a failure it has to have a way to reroute or retry the job and there's a lot of that detail which gets pretty complicated when you start talking about hundreds of machines uh, that the Hadoop software manages. So that's about as deep as we're going to go into Hadoop architecture. There is a lot in when you're actually administering a full-on Hadoop cluster and keeping everything performing well that we are not going to touch and we're just going to stick with a very basic level here. Uh, but you should recognize that if what we're talking about here is the simple basic level and to actually set up a, a giant Hadoop cluster there's a lot of administration activity that goes on in that configuration maintenance um, big task. Okay, so the next topic that we're going to talk about is the map reduce paradigm as it's often described. So we have our HDFS file system. We can put things on our Hadoop cluster. And again, we're talking about Hadoop here because it is the most common or dominant uh, technology and associated group of programs uh, that has evolved in this web big data space. Um, there are other software and environments out there, but we're we're using Hadoop as the main example, which is also the most widely used and popular example. Uh, but on a Hadoop cluster, you want to not only store the data, you want to run analysis. After all, we're kind of coming at this from the data perspective. We want to we want to search, we want to collect, we want to analyze the information that's on these these clusters. And we do that with map reduce. So it's called MapReduce because it has two major blocks of uh, operations. So we map and we send uh, a particular job out to the many different computers in the cluster. It returns a result from each computer in the cluster and then we have to have a way to collect all those together which is called the reduce component. Uh, probably the most common way to write such a function in its native form is as a Java program. Um, although, as we'll see, there are many other ways to to do a MapReduce uh, function. You can do it in other programming languages such as Python, um, but the programming approach requires expertise in programming, obviously, and also familiarity with the data itself. Okay, so we've been talking about it. Let's see what that means. Um, again, in the slides we link to a an image that describes that map, that illustrates the map reduce process. All right, so start on the left. We have a a block of data. In this case, three lines of text: Deer Bear River, Car Car River, Deer Car Bear. Um, we split that data and essentially the split means we're sending each piece of this out to a cluster. Let's imagine this is three computers where we've stored Deer Bear River on one computer, Car Car River on the second computer, and Deer Car Bear on the third computer. All right, now we get, starting in the middle here, our map reduce section. So we map we want to actually do a word count of our of our data. And so we send a function to each computer in the cluster and, and ask it, well, how many words do you have? On cluster one, we have one deer, one bear, one river, and so on, on cluster two and on cluster three. That's the map part. Now, there's actually an intermediate step, which they don't talk about uh, in the name, that's the shuffle step. So we don't say map shuffle reduce, we say map reduce, but there is a shuffling. So the shuffling takes all the input 
our our master node again is collecting this information back so it's it knows deer bear and river are on cluster 1 and so then it sorts together all the occurrences of deer all the occurrences of bear all the occurrences of car and then it's in a position to reduce them and actually count so we we add the bears together and get two bears, three cars, two deers, and then we kind of can kind of concatenate that re output into a a summary. But so you see here the mapping occurs on each on each node of the cluster. This is the distributed computing part and the reduction occurs at the master node. Now, this is a very simple function. We can write much more complicated functions, but as long as they can be split into a map phase and a reduce phase, we should be able to find a way to do it uh, on our cluster. Um, so that looks nice and simple in the illustration. Um, if we look at even the most basic example of a word count, this is the one provided uh, as sort of the first step in a tutorial at the Hadoop uh, documentation. This is what a Java program looks like that does a word count. And this may look simple to some Java programmers out there. I'm sure it does. Uh, but to someone who's not familiar with Java, like me, this looks reasonably long and complicated. Um, so we are going to talk about ways to avoid the full-on programming approach uh, to, to actually running analysis on our data. So that's coming up in the hands-on part. On the other hand, the programming ap approach is obviously more flexible. You can really get in and do whatever is possible to do with your data uh, with if you have the programming skills and if you know exactly how your data is structured. But that's a high barrier for some people. So on this slide, I've also introduced, I've also linked two video intros. Uh, the short intro is a really nice um, video that will put this moving back and forth of data in the cluster in a nice context for you. I'd really, I, I think that's a very good place to start. And the longer video is uh, close to an hour and a half and talks about many of the elements in the Hadoop ecosystem we're going to touch on in our session in our upcoming videos uh, but you may want to take a look at that as a comparison one big video all right so a little bit more about working with Hadoop and this will be the last slide for this section um, when we're working in the Hadoop ecosystem every part has its own command line tools when we talk about a Hadoop cluster we have ways to get into the operating system and configure that cluster. Um, when we want to work with putting and getting files, there are command line commands like Hadoop FS put to place something into the system that handles that, you know, treats it just like you would a file on your on a single local PC, uh, but sends it out to the distributed file system. So this is the work that Hadoop is doing for us, is letting us kind of get in and do things with some simple commands. Uh, if you're running a production system, you're going to have to do a lot of command line configuration to get it just the way you want for your own data. Um, so we're going to take shortcuts in our illustrations by using some pre-built environments. And just, again, be aware when you really do this, you want to customize it for your own environment. And that's going to be a bit more work, but will also have lasting value uh, compared to what we're doing as demos today. Um, so, again, just to illustrate, uh, some people build Hadoop clusters out of, you know, Raspberry Pis just for, just for fun or just to show that they can do it at at a small scale. So this is a toy Hadoop cluster that you know can still store a little bit of data. Uh, a big Hadoop cluster can get quite large. This is actually one of the early famous pictures of 
the Yahoo Hadoop cluster, and Yahoo was one of the original um, developers, as we've said, of this technology. So, you know, hundreds and hundreds of of servers all spinning with their own data. And again, as we've mentioned before, Google has um, has dealt with this in their own way, somewhat more proprietary, but you can read a bit about it uh, and learn about it if you search on Google for a Google Big Query, you'll see uh, some of that information. If you search on Bing, you'll probably uh, explode the internet if you search for Google Big Query on Bing, but you can try that as well. All right, so that's the end of this part of the of the presentation. Uh, this is the last sort of slide only part before we dive into hands-on work. So that's coming up in part three. Part three, we're going to use Amazon Web Services to uh, spin up a Hadoop cluster.